a very warm welcome to all our attendees. I am Dr. Ritu Dangwal, your host for today. We have teachers, parents, students, educators, and people from corporate world joining us. I would like to thank all of you for your overwhelming response. We received quite many questions that you had posed to Professor Sugata Mitra. In the interest of time, we selected the most relevant under the three categories, curriculum, pedagogy, and assessment. Professor Sugata Mitra will be answering those selected questions during the webinar. Before I go any further, can I make a request? Please take a moment and share this session with your peers and colleagues. We have pasted the YouTube and Facebook link under the chat box. It would be great if everyone else gets the opportunity to view the session just like us. Now, I would like to introduce three amazingly inspiring experts who have joined us in today's action-packed webinar. Professor Mabel Quiroga, the challenger from Argentina. Professor Sugata Mitra, the expert from India. Dr. Prabhu Agarwal, the moderator from India. A few lines of introduction. Professor Mabel Quiroga is a language teacher, teacher trainer, and education innovator with more than 30 years of experience in the field of language teaching and technology. As director and founder of self-organized learning environments, Seoul, Argentina, she has conducted research at all levels of formal education and has spoken at national and regional conferences on the benefits and challenges of the Seoul approach in mainstream education. Currently, she's devising training methods to involve whole families and local communities to use Seoul to overcome the limitations that COVID lockdown has imposed on children all over the world. Welcome, Professor Mabel Kiroga. Professor Sugata Mitra. Professor Sugata Mitra is best known for his hole in the wall experiments, self organized learning environments, and schools in the cloud. Professor Mitra claimed that children in the rural slums of India, many of whom have never seen a computer before, had used the computers in the walls to teach themselves everything from character mapping to advanced topics such as DNA replication. He suggested that the same access replicated on a global scale could lead to unstoppable learning through a worldwide cloud where children would pool their knowledge and resources in the absence of adult supervision to create a world of self-promoted learning. Professor Sugata Mitra retired in 2019 as Professor of Educational Technology at Newcastle University in England. He is the recipient of many awards and honorary doctorates from India, the UK, the USA, USA. and many other countries in the world. Among them, the Devang Mehta Award for Innovations in IT from Government of India 2003 and the Million Dollar TED Award 2013 from the USA. He's currently Professor Emeritus, NIIT University, Rajasthan, India. Welcome, Professor Sugata Mitra. Dr. Prabhu Agarwal. Dr. Prabhu Agarwal is the President, Vice Chancellor of NIIT University, Neem Rana, Rajasthan, India. With close to 30 years of experience in both academia and industry, he has held various senior level positions, including Assistant Dean, Mason School of Business, College of William and Mary, Williamsburg, Virginia, USA, Chief Learning Officer for the JSPL Group Companies, New, New Delhi, India, and Founding Vice Chancellor, O.P. Jindal University, India. A well-published researcher and teacher, he has worked with many clients in India and abroad and has designed and developed programs in executive education and management development, 
in the area of operations management and process excellence. Dr. Agarwal has a Bachelor of Technology from IIT Kanpur and an MBA and PhD from Foster School of Business, University of Washington, Seattle, USA. Welcome Dr. Prabhu Agarwal. Requesting you now to take the floor, please. Thank you, Ritu. Um, what a wonderful evening to all of you who have taken time from such of to, to join us today on this, what I'm gonna call a very power packed webinar. I'm so excited to be joined by Sugata and Mabel on this. Um, I'm Dr. Agarwal, I'm the Vice Chancellor President of NIIT University. And uh, the, the pandemic has surely created a sense of immense despair and confusion. The education sector is facing unprecedented challenges and needs to adapt to find solutions to keep students who are the primary beneficiaries motivated and engaged. Schools, colleges, and universities are all resorting to digital learning. However, online learning is being dealt with in bits and pieces. Educators are still grappling over the issue like student engagement, exhausted teachers, fatigue, lack of motivation, et cetera. I, NIIT University is committed to conducting a series of webinars, and I am proud to say this is the first one, uh, to bring about a change in the existing teaching learning system with digitization being the primary concern. concern. Big questions lurking in the minds of people are, what changes should there be in the curriculum, the pedagogy, the assessments? How do we reestablish parental beliefs in online education? How are parents and teachers coping? Is the physical class classroom the best experience? How do we redefine teaching learning processes in the so-called new normal? Today's webinar, anchored by Professor Mitra and aptly challenged by Professor Karega, is about imperatives in alternative developments and assessments of children. Education systems are driven by examinations Examinations define curricula, pedagogy, and therefore teaching styles. Current end of school examinations, such as CBSC, ICSC, etc., are modeled after the examinations of the last century. They provide no information about, stu uh, about students other than their ability to memorize boxed subjects like chemistry or literature. As such, current examination scores are good only as a crude and often inaccurate indicator for university admission. <clears throat> These scores do not reflect students' abilities, capabilities, preferences, mannerisms, or anything that would enable prospective employers or educators to help select them for jobs or courses. I hope in today's discussion, we will discuss alternate pedagogies, ideas, assessments, and certification that are practical and relevant for our times. I encourage all attendees to post their questions in the chat box. I will be picking up questions and coming back to Professors Mitra and Karega. So all to, to, to you, Sugata, it's all yours now. Thank you. Thank you, Phil. <clears throat> well, uh, what I uh, want to do is to first uh, give you an idea about the, the structure of the, the next one hour. Um, firstly, we are going to look at you know, three major pillars in education, if you like. Curriculum, which is what will be taught. Pedagogy, which is how will that be taught. And third, uh, assessment. How will we figure out whether what we wanted students to learn has actually uh, caused them to learn or not? So uh, why are we doing this in the first place? Well, you know, I mean, yes, there is a pandemic. Uh, that, of course, is possibly one of the most major reasons. But there also is another reason. And that goes to uh, a time which is actually uh, before the pandemic. Um, you see, uh, uh, 
right after about uh, 2015 or so, it started to become obvious that the, uh, that the existing education system was not providing the kind of people uh, that the work, uh, workplace was looking for. Um, not providing enough of them, you know. I mean, there were some professions where it was working, but there were others where it was not. So, if you, if you take uh, examples, I mean, if you take even a, a, a simple uh, example like a, uh, a low-end job, like a, let's say uh, an electrician, a very important job in society, but let's suppose that you want to see what is it in our education system that produces a good electrician. But then you notice immediately that uh, the system as it exists now is in boxes, you know. So what are you going to look for? Are you going to, in our electrician, are we going to look for uh, how well he did or she did in... Uh, literature. Oh, no, no, I mean, that's not so directly relevant. Shall we look at science? Yes, we will, we will. But then, uh, shall we look at chemistry? Well, maybe, you know, uh, maybe just a little bit. Uh, uh, what will we look at? Will we look at mathematics? Uh, will that directly correlate? Uh, if I needed a, a particular, uh, let's say, a regulator for a light to be changed, what is it that in the education system uh, that is reported about a student, what is it that that would tell us how good or bad an electrician uh, she is? So as a result, the industry started to build their own methods of assessment before they would actually hire someone. Of particular, uh, uh, particularly uh, uh, you know, affected industry uh, was one of our most important industries, the software development industry. What shall we look for? Well, you can look for logic, you can look for maybe a bit of math. Uh, what else? Well, algorithm building. Oh, but that's not taught as such. Um, design, design of thought processes. Well, uh, well, maybe, maybe a little bit, but you know, it's not really taught. So the industry started to give applicants problems to solve. So can you do this? And then the, the people who could, they hired them. So this raises the question of what, what are the changes that we need? So anyhow, I'm going to talk about it in, in three little chunks. Curriculum, pedagogy, and assessment. We'll break after each chunk into some of the questions that you might have. And also uh, with me here is uh, Mabel Hiroga, with whom I've worked for many, many years. She has seen my work develop from uh, almost the very beginning, you know, the first few years, and uh, has often pointed out errors in my thinking or in my perception of problems. So, uh, so, we, so we called her to this webinar uh, so that she could cut in at the end of each of those chunks and say what she felt or ask what she thinks might be a relevant question. So uh, let's, let's launch off. Um, I'm going to uh, I'm going to share my screen um, just for a bit. Well, uh, the metamorphosis of learning. Why metamorphosis? So that that was created by our students at uh, at NIIT University. Uh, uh, and they didn't call it uh, 
you know, the evolution of learning, or they didn't call it uh, uh, the changes required in learning, not even the future of learning, which I often uh, often call my lectures, but they called it the metamorphosis, which means, you know, you know the two famous examples, uh, the turning of a uh, caterpillar into a butterfly, or the turning of a tadpole into a frog. So the shift that we are looking at is not, is not a gradual change. We are looking at a conceptual change in learning. First of all, what should be taught? And what is all this for? What's, what's the system for? Well, I thought that you could make a really simple definition. You could simply say that education should enable learners to live happy, healthy, and useful lives. Not much to, not much to debate about that. I mean, you don't, you don't want people to be unhappy. You don't want them to be unhealthy. And you certainly don't want them to be not useful. So that's it. Happy, healthy, and useful. So whatever it is that you teach, whatever the student has to learn in a school or in a university should somehow connect with one of those three things. If it doesn't, then we're off track. Okay. So uh, shall we take an example? Let's take something that is done in school. The 17 times tables. You know, all children have, have to learn it. 17 ones or 17, 17 to 34. I can do up to about three or four. Uh, what was it for? Uh, did it make me happy? Well, I uh, honestly don't think it did. You know, the fact that I knew the 17 times table, I used to know it. I don't know it any longer. Um, is it going to, uh, did it make me healthier? You know, knowing, knowing the 17 times table, I don't think it actually made me much any more healthy than I was. Did it make me useful? Well, back in those days, people, our teachers might say, well, how, how would you, you know, uh, how would you figure out things? Uh, if you had to calculate something in a, in a shop or a, in a bus stop or whatever. Um, well, the answer to that today is very different from what it was in my time. You don't need the tables. So, when we, when we build a curriculum, we should question what it's for instead of making a list. You know, curricula are normally made as a list of things. What's the biology curriculum? Cells, and mitochondria, and plants, and whatever. You know, what if we turned each one of those into a question? You know, for example, let's take uh, uh, biology again. Uh, you know, one of the important things in biology that is taught to children is food. What happens to food? Why do we need to eat, etc., cetera, etc.? Cetera. And it's listed as, you know, the digestive system, you know, etc. Suppose I turned that over and made it into a question. But I could, I could make a an obvious question like, why do we have to eat? It's okay, but it's not not really that interesting. Or I might say, why do we feel hungry? Uh, that might be a little bit better. But you know what? If you're dealing with nine-year-olds or 10-year-olds, what I would do, and I'm just making this up on the spot, I would say, why do we have saliva in our mouths? And then, you know, I would expect children to say, what? I would say, you know, I mean, why is it there? Why is it there? Why you wet inside? Why, why do we have saliva? And then say, why didn't you look it up on the internet? So if I could design a curriculum that is made by the fundamental questions which drive subjects, then as a, as a, as a learner or as a student, you would know why you're actually reading something or learning something or looking up something because there's a 
question that you're trying to figure out the answer to. So questions and not lists. It's a simple change. You're not adding anything, you're not doing anything else. You're simply saying, what are the things that a child or a student needs to make them happy, healthy, and useful? And can I phrase those things as big questions? And you'll suddenly find that some things begin to drop out and some other things begin to creep in. For example, in order to be useful today, you need to know, for example, how to, how to do an internet search properly. So that's usually not there in the curriculum anywhere. Okay, it's kind of assumed that you'll learn it anyway as part of it. But what if I were to put it as a question? What if I were to say, find something on the internet that is incorrect, and then leave you alone for a little while and see what you come up with. So a curriculum of questions is what I'm going to say for this section. There, there are a lot of things to say, but then our entire time will go on discussing the curriculum. I think that one of the most important things about the curriculum is to change the nature of how it's put to the learner. Questions and not lists. So, uh, Mabel, did any of this make sense? What do you have to say about this? We don't have your audio, Mabel. We can't hear you. Sorry. Yeah, <laughs> um, yeah your, your recent article, uh, Children and the Internet, uh, I think it was published around April, May. Um, I read it quite a few times and um, I took you up on, on your challenge to, to think about dimensions to or questions to add to the curriculum. Um, and I made a, a short list for today. Um, shall I read it to you and, and, and you if you want, you can take one or two and, and I don't know, tell me yeah. if I'm completely wrong, etc. cetera. Um, so I, I, you mentioned this in your article, but I thought that then it has to find a place. Uh, in the idea of, of livelihood uh, and, and individuals um, coming up with uh, ways to sustain their livelihood uh, doing things that they like, and if possible, love. Um, the necessity that societies, most societies are facing today to have individuals um, who can contribute and participate in public debates uh, and, and do so um, with uh, good information, good data because also it happens a lot in post-truth societies um, that people tend to reject data, uh, hard evidence, and go by their um, beliefs, right? Just by their beliefs. Fears, uh, it's also a thing that I would uh, like to see in curriculums, how to, to help students deal with their fears and move on in life, no matter what those fears are, to, to help them find ways to overcome those fears, uh, to turn them into positive behavior. Uh, there is another thing that uh, many children are quite fond of, um, influencers. <laughs> YouTube is full of influencers. Um, every other child, wants to be an influencer. And I began to think whether that was a positive thing uh, and, and if children being influencers can in a way help to change education. That is what we are all looking for. Also, to, to give children the possibility to think about assessment themselves 
um, all along their educational lives and to come up with personal creative forms of assessment that will contribute to the general good, okay? I think that's my list for now. Uh, so what okay. do you think of it? Yeah, well, I mean, I'll, I'll focus on the, on the curriculum related bits of uh, what you said. Um, so, um, you know, uh, let me try and put everything together into uh, just one idea. It, it, uh, it, it won't address all of your, uh, your questions, but it will address a large part. You know, there are things that all of us can do well. You know, any of us, just think to yourself, whoever is listening, what is it that you can do well? And there'll be a list of things that you said, I can do those things pretty well, pretty well. Out of those things, there will be some that you like doing. So not only can you do it well, you can also do it, uh, you also like doing it. And there will, there will be a list of, a smaller list perhaps of things that you can do very well, you don't actually like doing them. Okay. So, in life, if one looks at the job or, or the work that you do on a day-to-day -day basis, I would ask, uh, is it something that I'm good at it, doing? And secondly, is it something that I like doing? And if the answer is that, well, I'm not very good at doing it and I don't like doing it, then you shouldn't be doing that job at all. On the other hand, if you say, well, you know, I, I don't particularly like doing what I'm doing, but I, I'm very good at it. Well, it's all right. You can live your life that way, but what's the point of living your life where you say that I don't really quite, I mean, this is not me. Um, and the best, of course, is if you say, I'm, I'm really good at doing this, and I really love doing it, I love my job. Very few of us are, are that lucky. But... I have a feeling that luck has only some very little to do with it. Perhaps the education system, particularly the curricular system, could be designed such that it focuses children towards those things that they do well and they like to do, and then to take them into professions where those capabilities are required. We don't actually do that. We treat everybody the same way. So what happens is, as a result, you, you end up maybe becoming a nurse. Whereas uh, what you really wanted to do um, uh, was to play football. But, you know, you go through your entire life nursing and thinking of, thinking of, that, of that football match and, and what you could have been otherwise. So I'll leave it at that as far as curriculum is concerned. It, it's actually a very long shot to, to get there. But I think all of us educators need to keep that in mind. Uh, but I'd like to actually turn to also some of the questions that uh, people who were registering had actually asked. Because some of those were quite fascinating. And um, I think uh, Professor Prabhu uh, ha has a couple of those uh, which he might, uh, you know, just tell us. Okay, so thank you, uh, Docs. Uh, I've got a stream of questions, uh, too many of them. So just to people who are posting questions, I should just encourage them to keep posting questions because uh, even if we can't answer them live, we will share them with professors uh, Mitra and Kuraga, and they will try to answer them uh, later on. But I have some very interesting questions, when, and one is... Uh, uh, and I'm just trying to summarize what I'm hearing. Uh, uh, what do you think? Uh, uh, this, uh, one question that's coming from Dhananjay Thakur is, what do you think parents should be, uh, what should be the role of parents uh, in, in the uh, co-creation of curricula? And another question that's also uh, kind of coming up is, and these are some themes that are uh, resonating right now on the Q&A board, is what should be the role of a teacher? in the uh, in the creation of curricula and third a question that i thought very interesting is should the word teacher or teach be removed from the dictionary <laughs> well, so i just wanted to so i just thought sure. I'll, I'll bring some controversies here to kind of spice this up so yeah okay 
and they are from sure. multiple people that I've kind of uh, packaged together. Yeah. Well, I'm again going to try to focus each of these questions towards curriculum because that's the topic yeah. we are dealing with now, although some of them relate to something slightly different. So, uh, but I think the most important and interesting thing would be this uh, a role that parents and teachers both have, which is that they understand the learner. Of all the people in the world, these two people understand the learner, parents and the teachers. So presumably they know what the learner is really good at. They also know what the learner really would like to do. Okay. It's unfortunate that in India, often enough, particularly in India, a parent might know that, that her daughter really is a really good singer. But with all great love for her daughter, she might then say, that's all right, but you become a doctor. Because, you know, doctors will make a, a good life, get, uh, you know, money and renown and everything. Singing, yeah, it's nice, but it's very competitive and so on. So uh, we don't often, we often shy away from the, from the basic desire of the child and the basic capability of the child, both as teachers and as parents. What does the teacher do? The teacher can also see what the child's strength areas are. And she would really like to, to strengthen those you know, uh, strength areas if, if she can. But often she can't. She can't because of another reason, which we will talk about in a moment. She can't because of the examination system. You know, it's, it's quite common, say, it's all very fine to do, you know, talk about, uh, you know, fun learning and big questions and all of that. But is that going to get them high scores in their GCSE or in their CBSE school final exams? Because if they don't get a high score, then they're not going to get into a good university. If they don't get into a good university, they'll not get a good job. They'll have a terrible life. Singing, it's okay. If you like singing, Go ahead, sing in the bathroom. But when it comes to your profession, you be a doctor or <laughs> whatever. So uh, that's a problem with parents. It's not a problem with learners. It's a problem with parents and teachers. And they really need to, to kind of go uh, outside of themselves. In, in the developed uh, countries, this problem takes a different shape. Uh, over there, there, there isn't this fear that, okay, if, if they don't move, uh, if, if they don't get into the mainstream uh, professions, so to speak, then they will not uh, earn enough money. That, that fear is not there. Okay, let him be a singer, let him be a footballer, etc., etc. The parent, the teacher, the school, everybody might encourage all of that. But there is the pressure of the assessment system. And the examination after all is said and done, doesn't put the same emphasis on football and on mathematics. Until we can move away from that, the pressure on the teacher remains different. So the, the parent and the teacher, they're both under two different kinds of social pressure to take the child somewhere. And unfortunately, it's often a direction that the child may not wish to. So this is a, is a, is a curricular problem. Really. But I'd like to, let's move on to the, the next bit, because a lot of these questions were pointing towards the next thing, which is, you know, how, how, do, you, how do you do, what's the role of the teacher? What should the teacher be doing? So let me move on to pedagogy. And uh, I'll go back to my screen sharing. Hopefully I have a slide on this somewhere. Um, Okay, here you go. I have a, a one-liner on pedagogy. It's kind of uh, really very simple. It, it, it's an absolutely obvious line. It's staring at you from, the, from, from your screens. Uh, if people can learn something by themselves, then you don't need to teach them. What can be simpler than that? So don't teach. 
what people can learn by themselves. But that will give us this, uh, will leave us with another question, which is, what is it that they can learn by themselves? Well, there was a time when that list was not very long. Before uh, the, the uh, information age, when uh, most of our information used to be inside libraries or inside the brains of teachers and experts, yes, in principle, you could learn, for example, how to become an architect by yourself. People have. But in practice, you would say that's a very long route. That's, that's really not, not very easy to do. You know? You'd need to, where will you start from? Well, what happens if you don't understand something? Where are you going to get your expert from? How are you going to go there, etc.? But everything changed. Everything changed because of the internet. Today, you could actually sit with your computer and say, I'd like to know how to design a building. And you could actually made, make a lot of headway. Maybe not all the way. Maybe not as much as you know an expert architect can, but a lot more than what you could have done before. And if you ask yourself, what are all the areas which are affected by this ability of learners to learn by themselves, you would find that list has actually become very, very large. Very large indeed. I'll give you an example. A rather funny and a somewhat scary example that I myself had faced. You know, uh, like everybody else, I sometimes download apps. I mean, not really useful apps, but fun apps. So a few years ago, I downloaded an app and it turned out that that app was main, meant for medical students to practice their diagnostic and treatment skills. So the app would give you a kind of a case study. And it would say, a woman came in complaining of a fever and a headache and et cetera, et cetera. And then it would say, well, what test will you suggest? What will you, uh, you know, uh, look for? And then it will give you some results and say, this is what, these were the results that you got from those tests. So what would you tell her? It's meant as a test for medical students. I started playing around with that, you know. And as you might expect, I was doing miserably badly. Everything that I said, you know, the, the system would come back and say, no, no, that's not true. I mean, the woman came in with a, with a common cold and you gave her a, a cat scan of the brain and that's not what you're supposed to do but then a few weeks passed and like in any game my score started going up what does that mean it means i was you know beginning to diagnose better and i was beginning to prescribe better and then a few more weeks passed and i started getting seriously good at it i would get seven things out of 10 correct. And that's when I started to get a little worried, a little scared, saying, am I becoming a doctor? But that can't be. I haven't been to college. I haven't been to university. I studied physics. I never studied biology. So why am I getting 75% of the answers right in a test that's testing for young doctors. I still haven't been able to answer that question. So I'm going to only leave that question with you. What does it mean in this age of the internet where you can pretend to be somebody that you're not? And where you can learn things by yourself. My work with children shows that children in groups around the internet can learn almost anything by themselves. So what is it that the teacher should be doing? 
in, in a situation like this. It would first of all seem to a teacher that what I'm saying is goes against teaching, goes against the teachers. It doesn't. Children may be good at learning anything that they wish to learn, but what is it that they would want to learn depends a lot on their teacher. I'll give you an example. Let's say that you want to teach a class trigonometry, you know, triangles, and that sort of thing. And uh, it's not the most interesting of subjects. The children disengage, nobody likes the stuff, and so on. Once upon a time in Hong Kong, a teacher made a question. After I had described to him this whole process of how children learn by themselves, he, he said, okay, everybody can use the internet in this class. Children said, yeah, wow. And then he said, I want you to tell me, how does a mobile phone know where it is? When you say my location, how does it tell you where it is? How does it figure that out? And the children got to work. Very quickly, they came to GPS satellites. And they said, you know, the, the phone looks at satellites up there and then it figures out where it is. And then the, the teacher and I said, how? how? How does it do that? And they said, well, we need some more time. And they work for a little bit. This only works in groups, by the way. Okay, Alone, they would say, I can't figure it out. But in a group, after about another 20 minutes, they said, it needs three satellites and it uses triangles. And, you know, I was keeping my fingers crossed. And they said, so what about triangles? They said, there's something called trigonometry. It uses that and it, from three satellites, it can figure out where the phone is. And that's when I realized what the new role of the teacher was. The new role was to point to an area point to a question that the learner may not have thought of by themselves and then to say, you figure it out. You go there. I'll come with you. Okay? So not the old role. I'll take you there. I know where to go. But you change that to you go there. I will come with you. So I'm going to leave the, the pedagogical bit out here and uh, to, to three different methods, actually. The first, a self-organized learning environment. Where, you know, groups of students interact around the internet trying to answer a question, like the examples I gave you. The second are hands-on. These are sometimes called fab labs. In India, they're called atal labs. They're fabrication laboratories where you can make things. Not, not make things with building blocks and paper and scissors and glue. Well, that too, but you can make serious stuff. You can build a drone. Uh, you can build a watering system for plants. I've actually seen children building these things in different countries. It's wonderful. How does the fab lab work? Does the, does the teacher need to know everything about how to build everything? Of course, she's not going to be able to do that. But you can, as a teacher, say, um, let's build an infrared thermometer which can detect temperature from a distance. And the students might say, well, uh, how, how are we going to do that? And you would say, uh, you know what? I don't know, actually. I just thought it would be something, it would be cool to build one. So you're mixing the approach of the soul and the fab lab together. And of course, the internet is at the heart of the whole thing. The internet will guide them into what they have to do. Both of these, self-organized learning and fabrication labs, are related to obviously play for young children. You know, what is play? Play is a combination of self-organized learning and fabrication. You know, build this, build that, run around, whatever, organize yourselves. And lastly comes the good old lecture. It's much maligned. People say, the days of the lecture are over. Well, they're not. I have heard groups of children say 
to their teacher, we don't want to find out this, when she asked them something, we don't want to find out this, you tell us. Okay. Give them that opportunity, talk to them. But it helps, as every good teacher knows, it helps if instead of a straight one-way lecture, you were to break into discussion. If the seating arrangement was such that you don't have a lecture and podium and you have the audience in front, but you had a, like a semicircle. Okay, it's not new. From the days of ancient Greece, this was the, the, the seating arrangement, the semicircle, where you can discuss. So I would summarize the, the key elements of the pedagogy that we need now is self-organized learning environments, fabrication laboratories, play, and discussion. And as you can see, all of these are possible over the internet, even fabrication. Yes, maybe not as well as you can in a laboratory, but you could do a cooking lesson. You could, do, you could design all sorts of lessons that children can do at home, where you give them a question, give them the internet, and say, now find the materials at home and do it yourself. So self-organized learning, fabrication, play, and discussion is where I would leave our discussion on pedagogy. And I turn again to Mabel Kiroga to see uh, uh, what she has to say about this. Thank you, Sugata. Um, those drivers are really uh, great. They make a big difference in primary and secondary or middle school education. Um, they bring a lot of emergent learning. Uh, my question this time has to do with what happens with soul pedagogy in higher education, okay? Um, can, we, can we say that interest is, is uh, native in, in professional learning environments that anybody who is in higher education is basically interested in uh, the different subjects that will um, give him or her a degree. Um, then if that is a given, if there is interest, uh, what is missing in higher education pedagogy or what should we change to apply soul pedagogy in higher education. Can we trust emergent learning uh, when we are extending teaching certificates, uh, engineering certificates? What would you say? Uh, what, what has to happen in the higher education uh, for soul to be as effective as it is uh, in primary and secondary education? Well, I mean, that is a, actually a question which I have, have been asked a number of times. Uh, and uh, I've actually had some amount of experimentation that we did at Newcastle University when I was still teaching. And, uh, I, you know, I used to teach postgraduate students. And um, again, a uh, funny story. I once told them that uh, if I'm going to teach you self-organized learning environments, I obviously cannot give you a lecture. For heaven's sake, I mean, how can I teach self-organized learning by giving you a lecture about it? You've got to figure it out on your own. So, uh, you know, it was all nice and fun and everything, and they worked on it. The answer to your question, yes, they got to everything that I would have taught them, everything you know, completely, the whole, whole lot. Having got through that whole thing, and finally when the assessment came, and I will talk about that in the next section, they did about as well as if I had taught it as a formal, uh, in the formal way. But I asked them, tell me honestly, what did you think of this as the method? Now that you know all about self-organized learning, what do you think about this as a method in the university, in higher education. And I still remember that there were a lot of serious answers, which I will not tell you about, 
because they, they are very serious. But there was a, a Japanese, young Japanese, I'm going, to, I'm going to call a Japanese girl. There was a Japanese girl who said something I remember all my life about self-organized learning environments. She said, Sudhata, what exactly are they paying you for? <laughs> okay. So, so this, you must remember that in a university, this thought is in the minds of learners. It's not there in school. You know, school children don't think of so much about school fees. Their parents think about it. But uh, university. So in the university, it is necessary for us to be able to convince the learner that the pedagogical learning methods that are driven by the professors and the, and the teachers doesn't necessarily mean that the professor has to go continuously talk every day. Okay, it's, it's a shift from a mindset, but that mindset is hundreds of years old. You know, the great lecturer, the guy who you know, people listen to with pin drop silence. How to tell them that maybe that's not needed anymore. Maybe we need something else. So the answer to your question, yes. Self-organized learning environments work wonderfully well inside higher education. Can I prove it? I'll prove it with something. Software development, which I mentioned earlier. Let's suppose you want to learn how to develop an app for a mobile phone. You're not going to get a book on it. You might find a teacher, except that the teacher will be busy building apps and making money and won't have time to come and teach in a university. Oh, man. Yeah. Uh, why aren't you going to find a book? Because the book will not be current. By the time the book is published, it will be out of date. There is only one way you can learn how to write an app for a phone. is to teach yourself. Get hold of some friends. Now, where do you get friends for? now in the middle of the COVID, software development shows us the way. You know, uh, to tell everybody, I just learned how to write an app. Okay, believe it or not, I actually wrote one and it works. Mm -hmm. So in the process, I taught myself Java. I mean, I, I already knew other programming languages, but I taught myself Java. I taught myself how to test it on phones. I taught myself Google Play Store, how to put stuff up there and so on and so forth. When I said taught myself, did I do it alone? No, I did it along with hundreds and hundreds of developers, all in virtual space. Okay. All I had to do was put up a question and say, this statement isn't working. This is what I wrote and it's not doing it. Five minutes and from all the continents, hmm. the answers come in. This is what you did wrong. Okay. It is marvelous. It is the future of learning, software development, the way it's going now. Why can't we copy that model and apply it into other subjects? Well, it's easier said than done, but I'm going to leave you with that thought as an answer to your question. Thank you. Uh, did, did, you did you have... Uh, Anything more, Mabel? Like I could see you uh, were, uh, you know, kind of frowning. No, 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 no that's no? fine. All right. All right. <laughs> I have okay. more food for thought, okay? Okay, all right. <laughs> I, think. all right. I think let's go to Prabhu now and, and, and see what, yeah, uh, yeah. what our, our, my goodness, 270 people are saying. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so there's a lot of stuff coming along and I think uh, it's just very... Uh, uh, let me take a few uh, big themes that are coming along. And I think towards the end, Sugata, you were answering one of those questions. But uh, the theme is today is uh, moving to online learning, right? I mean, the, there's a lot of questions on online, the online environment. And one of the questions that just popped up is uh, from Maya Divakar. says, I'm familiar with Seoul. However, how do I bring the element of collaboration in an online class? And I wanted to add my, my little yeah. element. There's this whole big debate about flipped classrooms. Mm -hmm. Now, what is the magic here? What is synchronous, asynchronous? I'm just leaving you with an open question. Okay, I think it's a very important question. And uh, keeping an eye on the, on the clock, I'm, I'm going to uh, sort of take only that one because I think it's, uh, it's a very important issue that you raised. Okay. First of all, first of all this issue about uh, the flipped classroom, 
the idea is that instead of uh, is is that i uh, record my lecture for example and i give you the recording and i say go home and listen to that okay don't waste classroom time and come back into class and only ask questions about my lecture okay um, it, it's all it's okay but it's not something you would do every day okay it kind of gets boring because also you cannot control the conditions under which different learners are listening in a classroom you can you know that you know everything is controlled but maybe one learner is in a quiet place another learner is in a noisy place another learner doesn't get the time to listen is listening on a bus with earphones they're getting different inputs so the flipped classroom does work but once in a while and the first part of your your question uh, which had to do with uh, how how collaboration yeah how, how do you get collaboration over the internet well i've tried a couple of things you know i don't have the answer but i've tried a couple of things on zoom for example you can create breakout rooms i uh, quite recently a couple of months ago i did a soul with 400 children 400 children across the country uh, it was set up by a school in goa and they created some 40 or 50 of these rooms breakout rooms so i would raise the question and then i would say that okay you get into that breakout room but do not go don't go more than four or five of you into each room once you do that you get the environment we want which is one computer to four or five children that's how souls work and then the four would use one internet connection you can tell them how to do that okay so there is a technical way to to kind of simulate what you would have done in a classroom in a classroom of 20 learners you would have given them five computers and said go ahead and research it so naturally if there are five computers and 20 learners they will make groups of four you can simulate the same situation in video conferencing environments microsoft teams in the google meet all of them have uh, these features available is it as good as shoulder to shoulder well to be very honest prabhu it is not let let's not pretend that online is going to be as good but the answer to can we do it the answer is yes we, we can so yeah, i'm um, going to let you move on because i have a lot of questions but in the interest of time i think we need to hit the most important piece in my okay. opinion <laughs> which is i know is that yes 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 i know i know I'll yeah i do take that as your okay. next topic of conversation Okay. Okay. I'm I'm going to move on to do assessment. Okay. All right. So, assessment, which is the whole examination system, the stuff that makes us makes learners nervous, uh, gets them tensed, um, you know. depression uh, it even goes to to suicide and, and you know you've all heard the horror stories about what examinations can do why are they like that what is it about an examination it is so bad why do we hate an exam well some answers are, are obvious in england once I asked this same question to a 17-year-old, and I said, "Look at this question. You know, this is a, a A-level question paper. Take a look at this. What do you think?" And he said, "I know. I thought he would say, 'What an awful question.' He didn't say anything like that. What he said was, 'So there's nothing wrong with that question. It's actually quite an interesting question. But all I want to say is, that, okay, you need me to answer that question.'" to give me my phone back <laughs> i said what he said give me my mobile phone back so that i can look up the answer that is our biggest problem with exams our definition of cheating what does it mean what does cheating mean cheating means you don't know the answer to the question but you look at somebody else who does and you write down what they are writing 
is it bad you ask yourself this question and it might sound very silly but why is it why is it bad it was bad it was terrible in the time when you could have been alone and faced a problem with no one to cheat from and then because you had cheated in school you couldn't solve the problem and you got into really bad trouble that was the reason that the 19th and earlier centuries focused on examinations to test for can you solve problems alone without any assistance or without any assistive technology why because in real life if you are on a ship in the middle of nowhere you do, you need to find out where on earth you are you need to remember what you did in your astronomy class you need to remember your trigonometry you need to know how to estimate an angle just by looking and then you need to know enough math to figure out where you are but to the 17 year old sailor of today that doesn't really make much sense does it all he needs is a phone and a signal now you might ask well, what if there is no signal what if the mobile phone doesn't work but i think that's a, what do they call it i think they call it a luddite question you know what would happen to the world if all the technology were to disappear and we are so heavily reliant on technology what will happen well that's what's happening to us now okay we can't fly we can't drive uh, so what happened to us <laughs> we are at home nothing much but you know this whole issue of what if all the technology died what if the internet died what if all the batteries failed then what's going to happen well we'll go back to the jungle okay does that mean that in our education system we must teach people how to survive in a jungle just because we may ever have to go back there if everything were to fail why should i assume that everything is going to fail after 20000 years of civilization have we come 20000 years to fail so education systems should be based on the fact that you use the latest technology that you have to solve the problems of today so what should what what should assessment be well give them their phones back let them use the internet. and let them solve the problem if looking up the internet if looking up google is cheating then all of us are cheating all the time so then what should i assess if i ask a stupid question and if i let you use google you're going to answer me in 2 seconds that doesn't that's, that's not on i think we should look at three things three key elements comprehension your ability understand content quickly and accurately communication your ability to transmit your understanding to another person and computing by computing i don't mean writing computer programs i mean the ability to use the internet to find things to find solutions to problems accurately find the right answer to be able to understand the right answer and to be able to communicate the right answer to somebody else this is all that we need to measure if you're not doing that you're still measuring stuff that was useful 100 years ago so how are we going to measure comprehension communication and computing you know there are tests but they're not particularly good tests i have a feeling that we need to look at another method of assessment a method of assessment which copies the way in which phd's are evaluated 
You know, in our education system, we have exam after exam after exam, all through school, all through college, all through university, until we reach the highest degree, the PhD, and then the exam changes to an oral verbal examination, to a discussion. So I'm going to suggest that we assess for comprehension, communication, and computing through conversation with students, conversation between students, and the ability to look up things and explain them. It will need a lot of work on the part of educational planners and educational thinkers to be able to work through an assessment system like that. But I can tell you one thing, if we do succeed, then assessment will forever be something that a student would look forward to instead of getting depressed about. So I'm going to leave assessment at this. Comprehension, communication, computing, measured through conversations and the ability to look up the internet. Let's go to Mabel then. Mabel, what, what, what do you think of this? I, I was listening uh, very carefully um, and I think you in a way have given me uh, the answer uh, to the question I'm about to, to put to you, uh, which is, you know, we have some recent examples um, of uh, examination boards um, and uh, systems um, producing utter failure, uh, trying to adapt to COVID times. Why do I say failure? Because their main focus, I think, was to prevent uh, cheating, <laughs> and it, they failed at that. So, what would you? Uh, it was massive failure, as a matter of fact. I have some examples uh, from from different countries. Um, what would be your advice to them uh, if they want to make things right uh, in the very near future? Because this pandemic is here to stay for quite a bit now. So we need to find solutions yeah. urgently. Uh, absolutely. Um, you, you know, uh, uh, that question uh, has, has suddenly become very important because of the pandemic. But this, uh, I have already been saying for a number of years now that we should allow the internet during exams, as I, as I just mm -hmm. said. Uh, we still don't. Nobody listened to me, so, so we still don't. Now that the exams have to be conducted online, people have gone to ridiculous extents saying, put a second camera, we will watch your every move. You know, digital invigilation. I hate that word, invigilation. <laughs> Over the internet. It's, it's obviously going to fail. It has failed. Children have found endlessly creative ways to cheat okay, in the online environment. So what's the obvious way to solve this problem? Give the children or give the students a question paper and tell them, go ahead, cheat as much as you can. <laughs> I'll give you an hour and you come back with me. There are a couple of assumptions here. First assumption is that if there are a group of learners answering an exam paper for, let's say, one hour. If they're allowed the internet, then everybody will get the maximum possible marks. I think that's wrong. I, I think we need to test that hypothesis. Who, who has said that they are going to? I think that the, that, that the good, good learners will still get good marks. And the poor learners will still get poor learner marks, given the internet or not given the internet. Okay. The second uh, assumption that we make is that uh, if you are allowed to look up the internet and if you are given the same amount of time that you were given for answering without the internet. So if the exam was for one hour, I still give you one hour and I allow you the internet. Chances are that you will spend the bulk of your one hour on answering the first two questions. While you look up the internet, look for you know Google search results and which one is correct, which one is not, what are the users saying, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. I don't think that we need to be scared of this. 
I think we just need to change the questions. We don't need stupid questions. We need questions which start with, here, I'll, I'll give you a tip. You need questions which start with, what do you think? That's all. That's all you need. Then all the cheating in the world is not going to help you because the internet can tell you everything else except what you are thinking. And what I'm asking you is, what do you think? It will be easiest, it will be very easy to, to evaluate such answer papers. It's a small change. And I hope that universities and the people listening will experiment with this. You know, these are unknowns. Will, children, will examinees with the, with the internet get a lot of scores which they otherwise won't get? I don't believe it. Will bad students start doing very well? I don't believe it. Will good students go astronomically well in exams? I don't believe it. Hmm. We need to try. Okay. And if there are any NIIT, <laughs> all right, if there are people willing to experiment, I, I actually have a design that I'm uh, trying out on the internet. Um, well, so so we've gone over curriculum, just to revisit, uh, and I, I just left behind single ideas. Curriculum, change it to questions, not to lists. Interesting questions under each subject. <coughs> Pedagogy, rely heavily on the internet. Self-organized learning, distance learning, learn by yourself, Construct things on your own, construct solutions to problems, play, and discussion. All of that can be done online or physically as, as you wish. And finally, assessment and saying simplify the whole system. Simplify it to can this person that I'm examining, can he or she find answers to questions or problems? can understand the answer and can communicate it. Just test for that. If they can do that, everything else will follow. So uh, that, uh, I think, brings us to, to just about the, the end of what I had to say. Uh, it's hard to, you know, we covered a lot of stuff and one hour is really very short. But I will uh, leave uh, Prabhu with the unenviable task of putting it all together <laughs> and, and closing the session. All right. Thanks, Dr. Mitra and Dr. Karaga. I, I am overwhelmed and flabbergasted by many of the things that I've heard. I've been in the education field, field for more than 30 years myself. And uh, some really, really thought-provoking issues. I don't know if I have to take questions on uh, assessments. And there's so much coming on. And we're we going to share this with you both. And hopefully, Assessments for PhD students take up to two hours. How can we spend two hours for each student for assessment? Okay, I'm just reading some comments. I would love to do what you have shared, Subhata. Uh, people buy exa examinations and questions. Uh, this will solve that problem. Um, you know, there's a personal question I have, but you don't have to answer it. There's this whole debate of assessments should be aligned to learning outcomes. But I think in a broad way, you have answered that learning outcomes. We want our students to comprehend. We want our students to, to critically think, and we want our students to problem solve. So in a way, I think you were answering that question. So I think in the interest of time, I'm going to thank both of my esteemed panelists to contribute. And I just want to make it very clear to our audiences that this is just a tip of the iceberg of what's coming. Uh, we're looking forward to getting into each area in much greater detail, whether it's pedagogy, curriculum, uh, assessment, and all these radical ideas. You know, I started off my introduction by saying that the pandemic has created a sense of immense despair and confusion, right? I think I want to end my com comment by saying the pandemic has also created an immense opportunity for experimentation. And, and this is uh, our founder, uh, uh, Mr. Rajendra Pawar, always says that, that it is the opportunity that we have to see in this pandemic. All of us as educators have this great opportunity to do something with this uh, opening that we have been given, to experiment, to test, to question, to look at how we teach, to, to question ourselves, to experiment, experiment, and experiment. 
I hope NIIT University will lead this in the coming days and years. And uh, thank you very much, Dr. Mitra and uh, Mabel. And uh, uh, over to you, Ritu, for your closing comments. Thank you very, very much. You're on mute. Dr. Mitra, you need to create a artificial intelligence app so that people <laughs> automatically unmute. Mute, yeah. <laughs> so uh, thank you so much. I would like to thank the audience for their time and hope this has been as interesting and enriching and as thought provoking as it is for all of us. And um, so hope to see you again. And thank you, everybody. Thank you, the experts. Thank you very much for your um, very thoughtful, insightful uh, 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 questions and answers. So with that, uh, we like to close the session. Uh, goodbye and uh, good night. I do want to make one very small mention. This is a completely student-driven initiative, by the way, from an I know, University. I know, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, all the uh, students who are the part of the Educatomic team. Thank you very much. Good night. Go, stay safe. Bye. Yeah. Bye. Bye.